Greetings, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Archaeology Cafe. We will um, get started here. So I'll have Steve um, come back on and he'll introduce our uh, tonight's speaker. So thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Thank you, Sarah. That was Sarah Anderson, the Director of Outreach here at Archaeology Southwest, who is operating this show from behind the scenes and doing a lot of the legwork. Uh, so we do want to acknowledge and appreciate her efforts. Um, I am Steve Nash, President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, and the, welcome to the third installment of Archaeology Cafe uh, for 2024. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Dr. June Sinceri of the University of California at Berkeley. Um, this is going to be a Zoom presentation, which is interesting because a few years ago, we thought we'd all become experts on Zoom. And now in a post-COVID world, we were expert in hybrid. And now we're into Zoom exclusively and there's all kinds of upgrades and so on. But Sarah is going to handle this masterfully. And Dr. Sinceri has an audience participation component here. So I'm going to leave you and turn it over to June and uh, please enjoy the presentation and thank you so much for being here. That was a very kind introduction, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate you folks uh, at Archaeology Southwest for having me. Um, it's an incredible honor. I was just saying I'm moving up in the world if Archaeology Southwest is asking me to give a talk. Um, and so I will do my best now that I'm teaching in person again to, to actually uh, share my screen and See if that works. How are we doing there? All right. Okay, so um, this conversation is really uh, years of people lifting me up and asking me to do things that are challenging. And so for me, uh, coming from the background I do as a, a mechanical engineer first, um, and as an archaeologist for my second career, uh, the idea that something as simple as building and cooking with mud, um, you know, I have a knack for making things ridiculously complex, I think sometimes, but also understanding how the simplicity and joy connected to working with these ovens um, relates to the human experience is something very compelling. So having that opportunity to to do the work with Ornos, these earthen ovens, um, has been a tremendous joy and all the people that have crossed my path. So the idea that today we'll be talking about how these things are made, how you know how do we use them and thinking about what as archaeologists we might see in um, after they're gone, some of the things that we'll cover. Um, and you know, there, there unfortunately um, are some Ornos that were harmed in the making of this slideshow. So uh, understand that, you know, many of our Ornos don't survive um, and, and, as a, and they die for science. So let's see if we can learn something from that process. I wanted to start with the folks who brought me here. Um, and, you know, beginning with the, the folks in the upper left-hand corner, that's the Vamusanga the um, Chimbufe traditional local authority in northern Limpopo province near the border of Zimbabwe uh, in South Africa. And that when I went to them as a Peace Corps volunteer, I was a mechanical engineer uh, who they sent home uh, from that two and a half years of service was somebody who uh, realized that archaeology was doing work in the living world, um, in this case, uh, in under the auspices of land repatriation. And it that has been a constant thread uh, in my transition to becoming an archaeologist, um, learning how it does work in the world uh, in land repatriation, um, in water rights cases, and um, in intergenerational knowledge transfer. So I think that I have a great debt, debt to pay to the traditional local authorities of Avasanda. Um, and then there are the Los Gonzaleses in El Rito, and the community of El Rito, the Esequi Association, and the libraries there, and in Abiquiu, the Pueblo de Abiquiu, um, honed my craft to the point where it can actually do some good in the world, um, and delivered to me um, a set of values that uh, I'm being held accountable to to this day. And so I appreciate their, their input. And of course, in these slides, you'll see efforts from Cecilia and John at Cal State University Concord, my co-conspirators, Stephanie Siuko and Ron Rael, um, 
uh, Joanne Key Lopez and and Albert Gonzalez, my colleague at CSU East Bay, whose discussion about Ornos and teaching with Ornos is is quite influential to me. The students in the Bare Bones Lab for Community Accountable Archaeology, um, the elders and staff for the United Auburn Indian Community, amongst others, who don't just uh, work with me on archaeological science, but also bring it into the realm of doing the actual work, right? That though I am speaking to you from the unceded and stolen land of Chochenya speaking Ohlone people here in Weichin, the land acknowledgement you didn't hear me give um, is because this community of scholars and mentors are teaching me that it's more important to do the work than it is to say the words, right? So having scholars and mentors and leaders like this teach me what it means to do an archaeology that has an impact in the now and helps us build the world we want to live in is, uh, is again, that tremendous debt of the, this community, uh, to this community that I own. And to you, you find folk listening in. We're going to try this poll because I've been lecturing all day and, and God knows that I'm a professional blower and I could go on forever, right? So hopefully by hearing from you, what you want to go into um, will allow us a little bit more flexibility and to use our time in a way that you'll be able to um, direct the conversation towards the things you're more interested in. And so um, stay tuned for how we will get you involved. But I thank you too for your bearing with me through this process. So starting out with why Ornos. Um, early on, we talked about Chimbukbe. We talked about, um, you can see in the lower left-hand corner from the view from the Musanda, the, pla the place of traditional local authority where the king and chiefs of Chimbukbe um, administer um, the several villages involved, including Hanani village, Moronga, Malandini, Chimbukbe, uh, Tichita Mbamunwe is one of the schools in Chimbukbe. They do all that work from up there. And that landscape that you see is something where they were removed and pushed onto during apartheid. So where once upon a time they lived in the Limpopo River Valley where there was lots of fresh water on the surface, um, the apartheid government pushed them out of that um, lush area along the Lavubu uh, onto places that were marginally arable, horrible agricultural uh, land. Uh, and one in which that had been mostly denuded by previous industries, including the production of iron, for which Chimbufe, the word Chimbufe is the, the breath of the smelter. Um, Chimbufe was so famous um, that their iron, their steel, was actually competing with Damascus up and down the Swahili coast. This is a community whose steel smithing and, 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 and steel production um, was, was famous on a global scale. And so that landscape you're looking at was transformed by these industries. Um, when you look at the upper right hand corner here, these iron smelters um, removed and jacketed and taken back to the Ditsong Museum, which is the South African version of the Smithsonian. Archaeologists for 40 years had the idea that, you know, they, the Venda people couldn't possibly have smelted enough iron to produce the sheer quantity of steel that was being exchanged. And so they must have stolen it from these settler colonialists and reforged it, right? And you, you look in the museum and it's full of artifacts like these hoes and, and asagai points and, and things that are related to uh, iron working. But what they didn't understand is that, yes, these little tiny smelters produce tiny little blooms of iron, but the thermodynamic process um, that occurs here is such that you have to dismantle the facility every time you're done with it, right? If you can imagine from where we're standing in the lower left-hand corner all the way out to that skyline, hundreds, if not thousands of smelters through time over the thousand years of production uh, producing iron, you would understand that this landscape is actually an entire landscape of smelting and not just a couple of facilities. And so when you look at, say, Mrs. Wudowell's back courtyard here, and along her fence line, you see the two years, the actual smithing tubes blowing hot air to produce the right fuel air mixture and temperatures needed to create this fire. One of the questions early on in my archeological career is how do we understand this thermodynamic process and the mastery of it as a human signature, as a practice that we can track through time as archeologists 
reinstantiate their place on that landscape as a um a cultural um belonging right how do you use this kind of data in a land repatriation docket in a land claims court to to connect people to their landscape so early on thermodynamic processes were interesting and important to forming um my research here during my dissertation in northern new mexico new Arito, um the other thing that was happening was that as my colleague elver gonzalez points out um very few actual good archaeological reports, and if you're listening, you know, folks, and you happen to have a great, great literature report that I haven't read yet, please send it to me. But, you know, he, you know, Albert was saying maybe eight or nine of these things are actually usable in any way, shape, or form um, to, to, to really talk about what these kinds of facilities look like. And if you're using it, as you are in the upper left-hand corner, this is the, the site of Casitas Viejas, um, um, to the descendant community, but also known as LA-917, that's the Laboratory of Anthropology. Um, this site is, you know, the ruins of this site are part of a land grant that later on the government land office surveyors identified as, you know, part of these parcels that would then be, um, you know, uh, distributed to the, to the community. But if you put the thing in the wrong place, or if you're looking at the wrong plaza, the one with the ornal is not what the ornal is. Well, how do you know what you're looking for? And that has real repercussions, right? For how much land and water rights associated with that land that an Aseki association can claim down the line. These are compelling reasons to know what you're looking at. Um, and later on, we're oh, working with the public of the Abiquiu Library and Cultural Center in the lower left-hand corner, um, realizing that the technologies related to creating and managing these cultural landscapes should be part of teaching the next generation who will become the stewards, the guardians for that landscape um, is as important to the research as establishing the kind of archeological tools that we have themselves. So that the quick trip from South Af Southern Africa to the Southwest United States, but that's kind of why I got interested in these ideas. So back to Ornos, what is it? Um, and, you know, you see these two little domed ovens um, and, you know, right away, right? These are our little adobe ovens for baking things. Um, and, you know, and for today's talk, I'm going to talk about a few that I built in the re in very recently that answer some specific questions, right? And there will be research questions that go with it. Um, they're the ones that are right here back in the courtyard behind the building, the anthropology net practice building here in Berkeley. Um, and then there are there are some that are out in the world, such as the one on the right here at at uh, Cal State Concord, and I'll talk about why I put one out there. And there's another one out at Baltimore Ravina Tribal Retreat that belongs to the United Auburn Indian Community. But just building them and describing them and talking about them engenders some research questions. So let's take a look. Oh, they're also a place for possums to apparently make their home in the rain. So that's a recent picture too. All right. So the first one is, how are they made, right? When you say, oh, it's made out of adobe, what does that mean? Um, and, you know, understanding that making adobe is an art form requires several kinds of parameters, including, you know, mold making and form, you know, the what size, understanding the dynamics of, of uh, and physics of these things bracing against each other, um, coding them, maintaining them. Um, all of these things come down to some, some basic questions about, about how they're made. And we know a lot about Adobe, archaeologists do. But what we don't seem to understand about Adobe is, and it's the same argument I make for zooarchaeology students, right? They take a zooarchaeology cl class and we talk about, well, let's talk about the taphonomy of, you know, butchery practices on this animal body. What the heck do we know about butchery practices if you've never taken apart an animal's body? If you haven't spent time with somebody who knows intimately how those animals come apart, right? Having Mr. Gonzalez teach my students how he as a shepherd boy went up into the hills above El Rito to manage those herds and then butcher them, take them apart piece by piece, or perhaps folks in, in South Africa are showing me how to do the same thing with a goat, teaches us how zooarchaeological taphonomic traces indicate different, say, chenopatois for taking apart an animal body. 
Well, by the same token, what do you know about Adobe if you've never made one? If you've never had to churn it on its side in different stages of production so that it can dry more evenly. If you've not had to lift it up and understand that the mortar and the little kind of chunks that you use to shake the cracks. If you don't know anything about it, how can you have some interpretive framework for it? And so making them and practicing and understanding the dynamics of the bricks themselves and the process of mixing in the just the right amount of straw, not hay, but straw, right? Because it's straw. Or the right amount of temper or the right amount of cowl and clay content to, you know, non-clay content. Those are all things that are not just um, you know, intellectual, but they're tactile, they're muscle memory. There are things going on here. Right? And I would argue that little Reno here, um, his father, uh, Genisaro, descended himself from northern New Mexico, um, probably knows more about making adobe bricks than some of the archaeologists I've met, including myself. Right until recently, because his family and his community may have been making adobes in northern New Mexico for generations. So, one of the things we might ask is, what is an ornament? What does it do? Right? We know they cook. We know that there's this low, slow heat transformation um, of starches to sugars, or the denaturalization of muscle fiber to make you know more tender things. Absolutely. Down here, Yulia's family recipe for birria was exceptional. You know, it makes me drool just to think about it, right? Um, but but how does it do that? And what are the what are the factors? What are the variables involved in doing the work of an orno? Not just the cooking, but also the maintenance, the the preparation, the fueling, the firing of these things, and the management of that heat through the cooking process. Those are all things that we can explore. So the research questions might you know boil down to how can we know how much energy is stored in the fabric of the Orno? How do we know what the R values are in different bricks in the fabric of the Orno given different tempers, right? How do we know what effect fuel has? I can tell you one thing, Mr. Martinez here bringing me this load of rest, Western red cedar. He and I can tell you that the food that comes out of an Orno cooked with red cedar is really different then the turpentine flavor of anything you try to cook with pine, don't use pine people. So, you know, things like that, or, you know, for my partners here in native California, using oak would be a way to, um, you know, get a nice long, slow burn that doesn't peak out, right? Our thermal couples that are embedded in the ornals tell us a lot about that temperature profile through time. And then, you know, managing it, you know, here's me trying not to burn my face off or my eyebrows in this case, um, you know, using a pipe, you know, to, to blow that air into there to get those 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 back coals going again to make sure that we get an even heat through the life of the, the firing process. And then for archaeologists, you know, we're interested in, well, how do we know we're looking at an orno? I've definitely seen some folks give me some just so stories about circular piles of rocks and what they mean. So how do you know that that's an orno, man? So the question would be one for archaeologists to like piece together. You know, when they get hit by a giant redwood branch from 100 feet up and they get cracked in half like this one, um, or if we go out and intentionally kill it, knock it down, what physical traces might be left behind that we could use, especially if somebody walks in and, and carries away those heart stones and takes them to someplace else, maybe to use it as a foundation for another adobe wall or something. So what's left? So for me, um, you know, not our you know excavation is is one tool that we often use but increasingly i'm being asked to use um, non-invasive technologies right or low impact technologies right so the research design around what's left behind or how do we identify an orno revolves around a suite of instruments like the magnet bardington uh, magnetic radiometer up to the left um the ground penetrating radar in the in the lower left or the electrical resistivity tomographer array like this mini sting over here and so we might use some instruments to design um, a research agenda around that that visibility. And then, and then probably most important is, you know, what is it? Why does it matter today? How does this relate to building the kind of world that we want to live in as an archaeologist? What's my role as a public scholar, right? Um, and here's where I really rely upon the mentorship and the leadership of my community partners at the Pueblo de Abiquiu Library and Cultural Center, the director of Isabel Trujillo. Um, and and other sponsors like Debbie Carrillo, um, 
you know, showing us how the work we do our, it, with archaeology has to be translated to that next generation. But also, maybe these kids don't become archaeologists. You know, we hope not sometimes. Um, and maybe they'd rather use the skill set. You know, they ended up interviewing their elders and becoming videographers. They become folks who use the multispectral drone imaging technology for their work for Los Alamos, you know, in the lab in the national laboratory or maybe they become their own restaurateurs and they they figure out how low and slow heat is actually valuable and something that people want to reintroduce into that slow food movement or just in the way that it transforms food into more healthy things to eat up here the um, united Arab and indian community historic preservation division um, knows that one of their principal mandates from travel council is to work the youth into the into becoming the stewards and guardians of cultural resources to the future and plants and animals and food and uh, ancestral places and practices are intertwined in all of that right so the research design might be around the along the lines of and you'll notice there are all, all their faces are blurred because these are kids but um you know the the tribal school kids helping us build um this oven having the the Historic Preservation Department, the the, the uh, intertribal fire crew, having my students come out and build this thing together um, to demonstrate the principles of corbeling, but also physics, right? Having the kids not just get me messy and muddy and fun, but the outdoor classroom that is a, uh, the tribal school when you're working with Adobe. Um, these are all part and parcel of the design for a project like this and and even thinking through working with the kids you know to use some stones to outline you know where should we put the bancos who are we building that for not just the cook what about when elders come out to the travel retreat center and they want to sit down and they want to you know relax by the fire on a cold winter day or maybe share some stories because cooking takes time sitting there and working together on, on producing and, and managing the heat and the food of an orno takes time and it's a place to sit for a spell right so unlike the ornos we have on campus, this one has more extensive bancos and maybe even one that extends all the way around so the elders can sit with their back to it in the sun and share time with the, with the youth, right? So the, the design of these ornos isn't just about um, figuring out, you know, where to embed a thermal couple and what the firing profile looks like through time, but also how it serves the needs of intergenerational knowledge transfer. All right, let's get it. I promised you, you would have a chance. I will stop talking for just a second. Um, you guys may remember the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Um, when I was a kid, you know, you you kind of like, you know, make a decision somewhere in the story and put your finger in the page. And then, you know, if you screwed up and died, you can go back to that page, um, you know, because, and as an you know, I guess I was a budding archaeologist then because the whole idea that you can go backwards and forwards in these stories and make decisions and affect the outcome. Um, I died a lot. So, um, you know, the idea that a choose your own adventure story um, has some twists and turns. Uh, hopefully you'll bear with me because uh, Sarah's going to help me figure this one out because we're going to ask you guys uh, for your active participation. Like, where do you want to go with this talk from here on out? Right. We only have so much time and I want to make sure you get to hear what you want to talk about. So um, here they are. The choices are. Do you want to ha have me focus more on doing orno construction and how it relates to working with my community partners here in um, Native California, in, in Native New Mexico? Um, or are you more interested in the geophysical side of things, you know, working with those instruments to see, you know, the traces of the ornos after they're gone? And don't worry, if we get through with one, we can always come back to the next one. Um, and, then, and then the last choice would be that you can vote on is to hear more about the experimental experimental ornos, the ones that we built, some to die, some to show us um, different thermodynamic principles, and one one designed with the eye towards um, mass distribution of the plans and means to make them across uh, refugee and border camps around the world. So there are three different ways to uh, get at this, and I think I think we have a poll. All right. So um, we will go with number two. Groovy. All right. So the ornos that are gone and seeing them later on. Now, this is actually one of my best cooking ornos. I just wanted to take a pause and, you know, uh, 
to, to you know, remember this this beautiful Orno. Um, for those of us who do ceramic material science, you can see the firing, you know, the reduction uh, of the iron oxides in this uh, in this brick here. Um, this is one that um, of the two Ornos, you know how they say which one of your children is favorite? This is my favorite Orno. Uh, it, it cooked the best. This one over here didn't cook all that well. This is the one that got hit by the tr by the redwood branch from 100 feet up in a windstorm, um, which gives me pause about operating in my back courtyard of the building. But anyway, um, this one died uh, and uh, we are reconstituting it, but we learned a lot about the fire affected bricks. All right. So let's start with the CSU Concord site. So when you're looking at the Cal State University Concord site, this one was built off campus. Because if you look at the two behind me here, you know, they're built at a cement courtyard uh, with, you know, uh, a culvertized strawberry tree running under some portion of it. So it's not exactly, you know, a natural setting that you would normally encounter with your geophysical instruments, not to mention, just try driving a, a resistivity nail through that concrete, right? But out here at Concord, um, you have um, a campus that was built on an old farm, uh, a ranch, that they then, so they had these open fields that were in kind of river alluvium, um, and they did an archaeological survey, and there was nothing in that agricultural field. And then the university, the campus, brought in all this fill, this this clean dirt. I mean, you got to have clean dirt in California. It's very expensive, clean dirt. And then they filled in this whole area. So then they built the administration buildings on one side now that it's been leveled out. But they left open this massive open field, which was great because we had a chance to build an Orno where it couples directly with the ground on fill that we have a pretty good idea of what's down there. But of course, before we started building, you could see our, our grid, our survey grid, a 10 by 10 survey grid, where we went out with the ground penetrating radar, with the electrical resistivity tomography array, with the magnetometer, with the drone and, and the infrared camera, right? And took you know as many readings as we could at several resolutions using a 900 megahertz antenna and a 400 megahertz antenna, um, just to get a sense of what was there before we got there. And big surprise, talk about an undifferentiated, really unexciting mass. <laughs> That's what was there. So then we built the thing, right? And we went out and, you know, laid out our bricks in the sun. And, you know, thanks to the help with our CSU colleagues, Cecilia, John, and those folks, that we built this Orno dead center on our 10 by 10 grid. Um, and we built it just like the other Ornos we've been taught to build by, by community partners. Um, and Albert Gonzalez and his father plastered it up really nice. Um, Johnny Keen Lopez got us started one day on a couple of bricks. So we had lots of hands on this Orno and it was beautiful. And as you can see with two fire extinguishers on either side of it, um, we built fires in it too, because the idea behind building an Orno is not just the almost 1,000 pounds of mud that goes into making this thing and the compression of the subsurface strata beneath the facility, right? But also the transformation of some of this mud through heat. So, you know, archaeomagnetometry uh, is not something I've gotten into just yet, uh, but, you know, that's another thing. When you expose um, these bricks to upwards of 600, 700 degrees of heat over time, you change um, things chemically, materially, um, and, and magnetically, right? And so remember, we ran a magnetic radiometer over this. We got something that's crushing. The hypothesis was that just the presence of use and use of the Orno should, at some quantitative level, affect the underlying substrate, right? So we built the thing, and over a year we used it and made great cookies and pizza and stuff. Um, and then, uh, you know, went through some seasons here in California, you know, seasons. Although I'm from Southern California, so I think Northern California does have seasons. Like right now, I can see my colleagues hiking down the sidewalk. Um, there's rain. Uh, but when it, but we came out and actually finished it off. So here's one of our, our team, um, Shelby. Um, knocking it down with a, with a with a pressure washer just to kind of accelerate the process at the end. You have the heart, heart stones left behind, you know, the ones that you build in the middle. Um, 
and even these we carted away after a while. We did a series of readings through all of these stages to see what we got. And once it was gone, um, what was really interesting about this was that um, the magnetometer, once the once the actual and and of course we had to go up on a weekend or on off days. They had a lock gate with a long walk in because it's a noisy place. Using a magnetometer um, anywhere near places where there's electrical current or cell towers or Wi-Fi, it's it's dodgy at best. Um, and I think that I'd like to redo some of this experiments that we had with the Bardington uh, magnetic radiometer. Um, but going on off days or earliest mornings or things like that, we did have lower signal noise, um, but I'm still not happy with it. What I'm really happy with is what we got out of the ground penetrating radar and out of the soil resistivity. Um, and um, using them in different configurations, right? You can lay out those probes in different ways at the soil resistivity array. You can also um, change the antenna on the on the radar, right? And and my favorite, my baby, is the 900 megahertz antenna because it's a very low penetration but high resolution antenna. But it, but you know we tried them all. We tried all the different antennas that we had in our community part uh, and our um, collaborators through the archaeological research facility. I want to give a shout out to Dr. Scott Byron here, um, who you know uh, he and I have published a few things on ground penetrating radar. We did find that there was a, a modified um, and, you know, the radar test, uh, radar um, indicates a difference in density, right? That the, the stratigraphy below the installation of this feature did, in fact, get compressed. Um, and that that compression, that density change um, beneath the surface um, was visible, was detectable with the ground penetrating radar. Um, in both the 900 megahertz uh, series of scans as well as the um, 400 megahertz antenna. Um, and what's interesting is that usually you don't think of solar resistivity, the ERT on the right-hand side of the screen here, as something that you can pick this up. But in fact, it sees the difference in resistivity because of that density change, because of that weight. And so while I have yet to see anything conclusive through a thermodynamic modification, Maybe if somebody left one of the hearthstones behind on the site, um, hearthstones, not hearth, um, behind on the site, or maybe if some of the um, fire brick, you know, was left behind, it would it would peak a little better on on the mag. Um, that's something I still want to do over again. But if you want to learn more about what we got, oh, um, and this is connected, by the way, I wanted to do a little shout out here too the visibility of features affected by heat uh, is, for these kinds of instruments is something that is um, a pressing issue. So working with United Auburn Indian Communities, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and Historic Preservation Division, as well as uh, our colleagues up at UC Blodgett Forest Reserve, um, when fire, like in the lower right hand corner, this is the mosquito fire, one of the out of control wildfires that was swept through the California mountains here. Um, and you have a member of the Historic Preservation Division using the United Auburn Indian Community's LIDAR to scan the damage done to this grinding stone, this mortar rock. Um, because we've been up there before the fire and scanned it and realized that um, the fire came through here with such heat that it not only um, you know, damaged all the, the native plants that were up there and killed them, I mean, nuked stuff to 18, inch, 18 inches deep in the soil. It was like a nuclear blast. It spalled and shattered the granite boulders themselves, the heat, um, and basically wiped clean any magnetic trace of any feature under the ground. Um, and the interesting thing is, um, that's not really different than what happens to these ancestral places with the use of prescribed burns. You know, uh, when I was trained in wildland firefighting with the National Park Service, it was um, a siege mentality, right? You got an incident command and a tent city and you got people living in camps and you got bombers flying overhead. You're hoping a good shield ball of retardant doesn't knock the top off a tree and kill you, right? The whole time I'm out there, I was terrified. But, you know, 
that fire, the intensity of that fire, the idea of reducing fuel load for a 10 year window, because you want to hit it and quit it and not come back for a long time, right? When you're spending $4 million for a burn. That's a really different mentality than what you see in the lower left-hand corner here, right? Where the, the inter-crew, as they're known now, the intertribal traditional ecological restoration crew, um, who are um, a group of Native Californians working uh, to apply cultural fire to the land, but also use um, and mix an admixture of Western fire science, uh, you know, um, they trained uh, using the same tech, well, much better training than, than wildlife firefighters do in the park service um, and their sawyering classes, you know, all of that would be recognizable to any red carded wildland firefighter. But the difference is that when you go out and watch what they do and then do a boot scrape through the ashes here, um, the soil is healthy and good right underneath it. Two months after that picture was taken, Indian potato, native rush comes back into that, into that, into that, um, into that meadow and um, uh, Tip O'Moore's grandmother's tree, acorn tree with her grinding rock were completely undamaged. And the work that we're doing using geophysics is to say, actually cultural fire has a demonstrable and quantitative difference in how it protects these ancestral places, especially as our um, Native California partners are asking, uh, increasingly asking us to use those tools to see these ancestral places and practices, right? The radar doesn't get blown out the, the you know, from massive, you know, 100 year old ponderosas coming down and compressing things. The, the um, mag isn't blown out by everything being nuked 18 inches deep. You know, the electrical soil resistivity probes actually have a chance of passing current when there is an ash that's, you know, 10 inches deep and pedestaling every obsidian artifact on the surface. There's a lot that goes on with cultural fire that continues to keep a site visible through these means, these archaeological toolkits. And then we bring the tribal school, kit, school kids onto the site, walk them through a place that's no longer choked with overgrowth and brush, but also a place that we're starting to explore again together using these instruments and saying, this is an important place for these reasons. Here's what we can see archaeologically. So the geophysical instrumentation is almost exclusively what these communities have been asking me to work with. And knowing that fire is related is part of the deal. If you're interested in some more of our results, I put a QR code up here. You can scan it and you get this poster that talks a little bit about the geophysical um, results from our investigations uh, after destroying an ornament and using these instruments. Um, my colleague, my former student, and now uh, archaeologist for Albion Environmental in Santa Cruz, um, Nicole and I are writing a paper of, about this work, um, about the archaeological visibility of these ornos um, after they're gone using geophysics. So you can stay tuned for that. But here's a little sneak peek. So for those of you who asked that wonderful question, if you want to hit that with your camera, I'm sure our colleagues at Archaeology Southwest will put this up somewhere else where you can find it. Um, and we can, uh, and you can learn more about it. So hopefully that is useful. Oh, question, great. Ha. Um, so the answer I would give to that question uh, is that it depends. The ornos that were being used at, say, um, places that were the vanguard, like a good example would be Casitas Viejas, right? LA-917 was established as a bulwark against people doing end runs around Abiquiu through the Rito Colorado Valley. And if you imagine a plaza like that being used um, uh, not through as long a period of time, because by the time they established the plaza, uh, they had moved north in the valley at the, after the surrender of Cuerno Verde, and that whole facility was didn't really have a long use life. Um, the chapel or the only the chapel walls are the only thing left standing there because people basically picked up their vigas and left with them to move farther up the valley, where irrigating with acequias was a lot was a lot easier. Right, um, they went from a tactically focused landmark to a more agriculturally focused landmark as rating decreased up in the north. Right, so a place like that, you might have an orno that has a really, really short life. In a place like Abiquiu, you know, um, ornos in the main plaza there um, 
might have, you know, because they were a longer lasting establishment that was occupied continuously until like right now, um, an order that was built there might have a different signature, right? They don't have one there right now. So that's interesting too. Um, but they're building one, right? So there's there's ways to answer this that I would say they're not short-lived appliances in and of themselves, but the cycles of their restoration and use may be something worth evaluating, right? Especially since things like plastering is a community effort. How many people live there? How many people can contribute their labor? You see how many folks um, I have working with me to build these things. So um, it's definitely the kind of thing that, um, you know, you need to think about community dynamics and what's the longevity of any given gathering of people and their ability to contribute their labor to managing these things. And I hope that starts to get at answering the questions. Thanks for asking those, I appreciate it. So I am going to pull out for just a sec and go back to the question, right? We went to, uh, we went to the discussion of geophysical signatures using instruments. Would you like to talk a little bit in the time we have left about working with our community partners on our reconstruction? Or would you like to hear a little bit more about the experimental stuff that we built back here in the corner? It looks like um, the creating new forms of Ornos is, is taking the lead. Oh, creating new forms of Ornos, okay. Okay, so, um, Building Ornos. So one of the things that happened, and how did this start? Our, our community partners, they had come to campus um, to view uh, the, the Ornos, to have a discussion about, um, you know, thermodynamics and, uh, you know, kind of community cannibal archaeology. And then we had kind of a celebration. Elders came here. Here's Ron and I sitting with some of the elders, um, Annie and Brian. Um, and uh, the TIPO, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, um, you know, brought uh, venison that he'd hunted on tribal land to come share. We did a bunch of stuff. We did um, native foods. We did some, I did some carne asada. You know, the TIPO did venison. They, and uh, Annie made this amazing uh, gooseberry jam that she picked, you know, and then and, and, and preserved. And then we did a glaze on the, on the venison and then we put that in the orno. And did that low, slow heat. Um, it came out with this glaze on it. It's like super drool where they, you know, it was amazing. And then there's one of my little biscochitos. So we did this big visit. And, um, you know, we talked about the kinds of things we were collaborating on. And it was a rainy, crummy day. And and um, and yet everybody seemed to have a wonderful time. Um, and one of the things that we were um, asked by the, the preservation department, as well as these elders, were, well, why can't we have something like that here? At, at our on our own land. Why don't we have it, you know, for the kids? Because a traditional way of making food using low, slow heat included digging these big pits out, lining them with stones, building a big fire, and then scraping, you know, once that fuel had reduced, you know, wrapping things up and putting them in the rocks and putting more rocks on top and burying it, right? That long, slow cooking, that long, slow transformation of the food um, is traditional. And, and when a community is looking at traditional foods, traditional methods to restore health, to restore community, to, re, to revitalize culture, um, you know, that is all interconnected. But digging a hole is a pain, right? I mean, like, like really, you can imagine, um, you know, having to dig up this hole over and over again to process that food. Not to mention, what are you going to hit when you dig that hole, right? Um, was something that they had brought up as, you no. Know, less desirable but here's a way to kind of adhere to that tradition and use the earth to make food uh, through that low slow cooking method um, but without having to do that kind of work digging that hole out oh got a good question here this is fantastic so again talking about the archaeological evidence i would say albert gonzalez has it right that there's not too many um there are not too many really great, and again, I'm hoping folks have something in the great literature that that is different than this, but the idea that um, people identify an archaeological porno and then talk about it, right, is, is severely lacking uh, scholarship. And you're right. I mean, think about 
you know, all the different ways. You go to Pecos and you see those beautiful Moorish arches, right? At the Pecos Mission ruins, right? You see um, all sorts of ideology about how to build with mud, how to build with adobe um, that are filtered through the reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula. So absolutely, Dr. Lubin. Um, these are things that, um, you know, having the Ornos before contact, maybe not, but having a low, slow cooking methodology that processes native foods in a way um, that communities to this day are more interested in reintroducing to their diet. I mean, you saw one of my students, um, uh, Marino Baca, who was born and raised in the Espanola Valley, a Hanisero community member himself, who is actually, even though he's my student, he's actually enrolled in the School of Public Health because one of the things he's trying to do with Ornos is to reintroduce low, slow foods and the, the, the transformation of starches and, and sugars and all that other stuff through low, slow cooking as a way to fight diabetes in his community, right? He is interested in how to affect health outcomes by reintroducing Ornos and other native food paradigms that, you know, as you say, Ornos weren't necessarily native before, but the idea that the low, slow cooking was, um, and Ornos as a way to do it without having to do the, the, sub, the, the ground oven, the earth ovens um, that are under the ground, um, is important to him and to his community. That's what he that's what he's doing with it, right? So by the same token, the elders you see here wanted Ornos to come back to um, tribal land up in Auburn and be a part of teaching tribal youth about uh, these concepts and about reintroducing native foods to their uh, to their curriculum. So that's what we did, right? If you think of the tribal uh, school as a project based learning curriculum, having the tribal school educators and parents and kids be a part of building the Orno um, was really important uh, to understand you know, ratios and mixtures, how to do, um, how that, you know, that, that working together as a team is the only way you can build an unsupported corbel structure. I have to say, this is a huge shout out to the, the intercrew, um, the, you know, the, the TIPO Historic Preservation Division and the kids from the travel school. This is one of the few ornaments I've ever had any hand in building that we had zero internal supports. We never had to take one of our wooden molds and squeeze it up in there to hold up the vault. That by all these hands, and you can see my students and the fire crew working together and our colleague librarian from Alameda Health Services and me, um, holding it together just to the and eat these perfect corbels so that, that when that keystone, which was made of Adobe too, went in, the whole thing stayed up, right? Having that moment, demonstrating to the students firsthand how a simple arch or a complex corbel dome come together, um, it was a hands-on, in-person lesson in civil engineering and basic physics and, and things like that. And then understanding how, you know, mixing the, the, the finely cut straw into the adobe mixture creates a reinforcement, and how you see that in a wall stub that was hit, you know, for, for you know, um, designing reinforced, you know, uh, structures. These were all part of the lesson. So the idea is that the kids in this particular situation um, are all contributing their labor and also thinking ahead, right? When you come back and this is all dry and plastered nicely and we've got the fuels lined up because you got an intertribal fire crew who's going to cut a whole bunch of wonderful oak and manzanita and red cedar that'll go to fuel these, these uh, this Orno that you've built. You know, what do you want to have happen here, right? So having to say, well, I want a rack of, of elk in here. So that door's got to be bigger. I want to make sure we can do pizzas. Or I want to make sure grandma can sit next to it if she's cold. Or I want to have those conversations and interviews. You know, envisioning what they want out of this facility and knowing that for it to survive, talking back to that first question, it's going to require labor and, and resurfacing and reinvestment by everybody. And it will be a place where people come back to. That was part of the, the lesson of coming out here and doing this work. 
but it won't end there, right? Now here, I want to give a shout out to the students who are working on, um, on, on making ornaments right now, because each of the students in this seminar is not just compiling a set of recipes that would be um, easy to do with the school kids for the travel school, um, but also a series of lesson plans related to the common core state curriculum um, elements, right? So volume metrics, how do you measure volume, right? In, in the metric system or otherwise, um, thinking about um, heat and um, heat transfer, going back to the engineer's question, right? About thermodynamics. They're building lesson plans that are associated with the recipes they're putting together and compiling to go back to the tribal school at the mandate of the tribal school itself, asking us for these lesson plans to go with the Orno. So that the Orno at each visit, it's not just gonna be fun to fire it and fuel it and cook food in it and all that good stuff, but there'll also be lessons that go with it so that there will be you know, a cohesion, a, you know, a connection between what they're learning because the tribal school building isn't on the same location as the Baltimore or the uh, travel retreat, right? So it's really different locations. Um, and so when the kids do, you know, it's, it's a doing to get a bunch of kids out to a off-site location, um, there's more connected to it and they get more out of it. That relates to food, of course, but also relates to those common core teaching standards um, for math and science and social studies and stuff uh, for these kids. So it's been and really, uh, I, this crew of students not only don't mind getting super muddy in the middle of their weekdays um, to make these these breaks and, and rebuild our dead orno, um, but also to to do the work of uh, putting together these lesson plans. So I couldn't be more proud of them. And here's another thing for fun. So uh, if you all have your cell phones or whatever, I put another QR code up. Um, you can see in the foreground, our colleague from the United Albert Indian Community who you saw using that handheld LIDAR um, uh, came to visit and to show how that technology um, is being used by the tribe to capture you know, high resolution um, data about some of these ancestral places and practices. Um, one of my students, Louis Kursan Mayoraga, who now, uh, after his, his dress, this graduate student graduated and went to work for the United Albert Indian Community, but before he did, uh, he built a 3D model using the LiDAR scanner uh, in his phone. Uh, and so you can pull up this QR code and you can go to the model and you can manipulate it in 3D and look inside. And uh, this was um, uh, one of the Orno, this is the Orno we built at Concord uh, in one of its iterations. And you can play with that a little bit. It drives me crazy, actually, because this LiDAR, this handheld LiDAR, um, it's a $30,000 instrument, mind you. But back when I was an engineer doing accident reconstruction, you know, I was doing point clouds with a total station, you know, and it would take forever to figure out the crush, the you know, the crush vectors on a, on a bullet car or something that's been impacted by a bullet car. And so um, now you can just walk over with this thing and scan it, right? Oh, man, tech is getting crazy and I'm trying not to be too jealous. So that's something fun to play with. So that pretty much covers that. And I think we are just about out of time. So we didn't really get to, we didn't do much with the experimental or those stuff, but suffice to say that um, I'll just give you a quick preview that we did um, some work um, tempering these bricks differentially. Um, thanks to the heavy fraction donated to us by the Mono Lake Kitsinica, um, doing excavations for them on their, uh, as part of the work that we're doing together, which most importantly leads to their petition for federal recognition. Um, the heavy fraction, the gravels that they sent home, you know, when you do heavy fraction, you go through those geological screens and you know exactly how big every particle is in that bag. And the tribal council was like, well, wait a minute, you don't have to bring all that stuff back. It's just gravel, right? So why don't you introduce it into the bricks for the Orno? And then it serves the purpose of, of science and also feeding people. They, you know, the travel chairwoman would love that idea. So a lot of these adobes that we used were differentially tempered with different size and volumes of the heavy fraction, this, this light pomaceous um, uh, gravel that came from the Eastern Sierra. Um, and then we tracked where they were by quadrant. We mapped it out. And then um, using infrared photography um, and thermocouples, we could track how much 
heat was captured in these bricks. And uh, that is absolutely the last of my time. So I will stop yammering and hope that there are other questions or concerns that I could answer. Thank you so much, uh, June, for that really engaging talk. I, I learned a lot and it was fun to do the interactive part. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in. I know June answered some of them during the talk, but if you had some more, please put them in the Q&A. Put another QR code up if you want to visit some more about Ornellos that we do at the lab um, or other stuff that we do at the lab. I'm sure you could find more information there. And I just want to say I appreciate you guys for having me. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. And um, our next talk next month will be um, by uh, Jim Eno, uh, a lifelong Zuni Farmers Authority and Influence. So if you're interested in that, sign up for that on our on our website. So thank you all so much. And thank you again, Dr. Sinceri. We really, really appreciate your talk tonight. So well, thanks again for having me. It's such a pleasure. Um, this is quite a crew of people. And uh, I love the questions. And I will definitely follow up with some of them. Thanks, y'all. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, June. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Bye. Take care.